If you would, take out your Bibles to Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. And I suppose that most of the passages of Scripture, particularly from the New Testament concerning Christmas, are familiar to you. But sometimes the familiarity can actually have us to overlook some things that, uh, that are just wonderful and fresh truths when we take a, a fresh and new look uh, at these, the account of Christ's birth. We're going to be looking in chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 8 and through 14, and we'll be looking at the angel's presentation, the proclamation of the fact that Jesus is born uh, to the shepherds. And as we look at this passage, we, to give it some background, of course, you could uh, go back to chapter 2, verse 1, and, and there we see the journey the account of, of Mary and Joseph leaving Nazareth to, uh, to go to Bethlehem. And we'll read that full account tonight, in our, and, I, and I invite you and hope that you could come uh, as we have a candlelight service tonight. And our children will be uh, doing some things uh, in cooperation with that, looking forward to. But we'll read the full account out of, out of Luke tonight. But in chapter 1, uh, in, in verses 1 through 7, uh, Mary and Joseph are on their way, or traveling to, rather, um, Bethlehem. Now, Nazareth is about 65 miles or so north of Jerusalem, and Bethlehem is uh, south-ish from uh, Jerusalem by about five miles, so it's about a 70-mile journey or so. It, it isn't one that would have been taken, been taken overnight, um, and, you know, I'm not certain uh, how they got there. I'm not sure that Mary rode on a donkey the whole way, uh, I would like to think Joseph might have prepared a, a cart or something for her, and of course they would have needed provisions for it. Uh, it, it was a long journey, uh, but it would have taken them four to five days to do that. Uh, the census, uh, the registration they spoke about in uh, verses 1 through 7, and uh, Quirinius and Augustus Caesar, all of those are historical facts that's brought out, uh, borne out through historical research in those things. There's no question about that. Uh, but, of course, as everyone was returning to their native home, uh, the place where they were born to, or where their family was to be registered for the census, the city would obviously be uh, very crowded, much like Starkville uh, on, a, on a football weekend or, uh, or Tuscaloosa, anything like that, gathering of a lot of people. So, so they go and they show up, and, and of course, all of the, all the inns or the inn is, 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 is full. Bethlehem was not a large metropolis by any stretch, but, but they had no place to stay, so of course they stay in a stable barn, uh, and then we pick up uh, the fact that we, that Jesus Christ was born in the stable, but laid in a manger, and so that's where uh, the first portion of chapter 2 takes us, and we're going to pick that up um, later that night. You know, sometimes we need to pull ourselves back from our wonderful as they are, and I love them, of our Christmas Eve observances. It can even get our timeline a little skewed if we're not careful. We think of Mary and Joseph showing up in the dead of night at the stable. We don't, we don't know that. In fact, uh, and of course, the events that's taking place here would have been on Christmas night, not Christmas Eve night. Uh, we don't know exactly when Jesus was born. We don't know the time of year, actually. We don't know the day. We don't know the time of day. Uh, it could have been, and, and likely perhaps in the afternoon or in the evening or so, and the shepherds are getting their announcement from the angels after these things have taken place, and then they show up later that night. Uh, it, while it is, we do know that it's night when they do because of the scripture here, but they show up uh, to see what the angels had told them. And it is interesting, isn't it? We know so little, really, about the events surrounding Christmas. It's, it's not unimportant by any stretch of the imagination. But you know, much like we do not, I'll be careful how I say this because I don't want to diminish it in any way, but we don't praise an architect because of his drawings, but we praise them because of their finished work. We know in detail about the resurrection. We know in detail about the passion. We know in detail about the finished work of Christ, and that is 
truly what we celebrate even when we come here to the manger, when we come here to the stable on Christmas Day, we celebrate the finished work of Christ. And the very fact that we are here this morning on Sunday, we never cease to celebrate the resurrection. Every Sunday, actually every day of our lives, but uniquely on Sunday when we visit, we celebrate the resurrection on the Lord's day. But this wonderful account, this wonderful truth, this, you might even say, miracle of miracles, we pick up here as the angels speak to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. If you'd stand to honor God's word, we're going to look at this night. Oh, what a night it is. No other one like it in history. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom, with whom he is pleased. Heavenly Father, open up these such familiar passage to us. Help us to see the great truth from your word, the great work of Christ, the great purpose and your plan that you have in, in, in giving us a glimpse into what happened on that spectacular day, that evening. Lord, help us not to stop the baby in a manger. Lord, let us see him for King of kings and Lord of lords. Sovereign over all things, working everything according to your plan and your purpose. Challenge our hearts and minds. Thank you. In the name of Jesus we pray. All right, so we we'll have five areas that we're going to look at in this passage. We'll look at the shepherds, the angel, the message, the sign, and then the praise. That will be our outline. The, the, the verses will pretty much as we go through. But the shepherds, these were common men. Uh, you might say that they were the most common of the common. We can brush with some fairly large strokes, but we need to be careful because a, a group of shepherds was just about like any other group you might come across. There were good and there were bad shepherds. There were diligent. There were lazy shepherds. They were honest and dishonest shepherds. They were kind and they were mean ones. They were, they, they were, they were representative of humanity. And, but with a broad stroke, they were certainly they were not the elite of society. They, they lived a hard life. Oftentimes, the ones that would be taking care of the flocks would be doing so for an owner. You know, but, but these were men going about their daily lives. They were serving where they were and living life, trying to feed themselves, perhaps their families. The one thing we absolutely know about them is that they were common men, common people. You know, God has a soft spot in his heart for shepherds. He has a soft spot in his heart for common people. Not many rich, not many wise, not many powerful come into, not, not that none do, but not many, comparatively speaking, come into the kingdom of God. He has a heart for a common man, and that means he has a heart for you and me. And this... Announcement of all announcements comes to these common men. Abraham was a shepherd. Jacob was a shepherd. And 
The entire nation of Israel were basically filled with shepherds. King David was a shepherd. Psalm 23, the Lord is our shepherd. These were men who were taking care of the business that they were supposed to be taking care of. Wherever you go during the week, whatever you do to to provide and prepare for your family or to raise your children or whatever you do, just, just doing the things that you're supposed to be doing, maybe some things that you're not even supposed to be doing, in a moment. And that's what happened with these, these men in a darkened field on the outskirts of Bethlehem, Jerusalem, out in the area, in the region. You know, shepherd is the, in the Hebrew, the Ra, the Lord is my shepherd. And when you see shepherds written about and spoken of in Jeremiah, you see pastor in the New Testament, it's the same word, poimain, which is the the word for pastor, shepherd, tending. And it's likely that these men had come together at night. Doubtful it was one, it could have been, but doubtful it was one huge flock. But but what would happen for mutual support and for protection and those things, the the shepherds would uh, come to a common area at night so they could protect against uh, wolves and and predators and anything that might want to, and, 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 and thieves. They would also, we notice in this verse, Eight shepherds out in the field keeping watch. They weren't staying up each one all night. They would likely be taking turns. They would take a watch in the night. You could go to sleep. One or two would stay up and, and watch over, and each one would have their watch. It makes sense, and they were just simply out there. And this is evening after the daytime birth, or at least the, uh, after the birth of Christ. And then all of a sudden, verse 9. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great You know, God had been silent. We say this, God, has, God had been silent for some 400 years, 435 years or so since the writing of Malachi to this particular time in history. That's not to say that perhaps supernatural things that God did not intervene, but what we have revealed for us as far as God's revelation, inspired scripture, and those things, uh, and no real prophetic word for over 400 years. Of course, the, the Romans had come into power by then, or the Greeks had been come into power by then, and then been, been swept away, away by the Romans, and, and turmoil and, and, and just... Israel, the land of Israel being sort of a a 50-yard line, if you will, of of just conflict from major powers, and they were stuck right in the middle, and they were under the thumb of the Roman government, and God had been silent. But there was a messianic expectation at the time. In the fullness of time, the Bible says, that God brought forth his son in the fullness of time. There was, this, there was this tremendous expectation among the people that something was about to happen. Of course, we see that Gabriel appears to Zechariah when he announces John's birth. Zechariah is going about his daily business of being a priest in the temple, and he had gone in to, to do his service, and an angel appeared to him. Zechariah doubted a little bit what he said, so the angel said, you won't speak until John is born. But just going about his daily life, angels. I want to say something else about this. Uh, go back to verse 8 just for a second. When, when, the, when the Bible, uh, well, when, when we come to actually verse 9, the angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. The angels aren't present at this time. There's one angel the glory of God fills their environment. The Shekinah glory of God, the, the manifest presence of God, this Shekinah glory we talk about is this, this, this light. When Jesus is transfigured on the mountain, he, he begins to, to shine the Shekinah glory. Now, God is everywhere at, at the same time. He is, he is omnipresent. 
There's no place that you can go where God is not, but the Shekinah glory of God is typically kept to a place and time, not just one. But we think of God's Shekinah glory in the heaven of heavens where God's throne is, the, the light, the glory of God manifests. But here, to validate the story, to validate the account that the, angels were, the angel was going to give, the glory of God shines around, all around. God is present. And the angel appears to Zechariah. This is before this happens. We're going back for a, a few months here. About 18 months, the angel appears to Zechariah. And Elizabeth has a son named John. Uh, the angel appears to Mary to announce the birth of Jesus Christ. Zechariah answered in doubt, or questioned in doubt. Mary questioned in faith. And he submits to the will of God. Then later, in a dream, not an actual appearance, but in a dream, the angel an angel, Gabriel, appeared to Mary and Zechariah. We don't know the name of the angel that Joseph dreamt about, but an angel appears to Joseph in a dream to calm his concerns. We read that. He, he was a just man, but his wife, think of the, the humanity of the story. His wife that he has loved, that he has betrothed to, is now with child, and there's no explanation for it. Going about his life. One day like the next, preparing for marriage, doing all of these things, and an angel in a dream tells him, going to happen. Later he would see an angel in a dream that would tell him to leave when Herod is going to kill the young children. So we have this supernatural activity picking up and, and God speaking to man again through his messengers, the angels. Now an angel appears here in the middle of a field. People just going about their daily business. They were filled with great fear. We, we, we fight with this tension that Jesus is our brother, he's our friend. Too often we lean so far to that side we forget about the fact that God Almighty Jehovah God is awesome and powerful and majestic and infinite and filled with glory. Sometimes we, we think of God in a little box, but when you read biblical accounts of people meeting God, you see this same idea, this awe, this, this, this fear that comes over. And, and some of the best news that you could hear in this case is, we've got good news. Well, what does he say before that? He says, fear not. John, in the Revelation, sees the glorified Christ. And this is the John who, who leaned upon Jesus at the Last Supper, who is the love, beloved disciple uh, the apostle who had witnessed everything that Christ had done, and John turns and sees the resurrected Christ in his power in the book of Revelation, and he falls at his feet as though he were dead because he was overwhelmed with the presence of God. This filled with great fear. This is megophobos, a, a megaphobia. And that is always, that is always, I don't know of an exception, that is always the response when people truly be just overwhelmed. Brad preached last week. God has given him a name above every name. People will then be compelled not by someone standing behind them and pushing them forward, but they will be compelled by the reality of who Jesus is to bow down and proclaim him King of kings, and Lord of lords. We get into the presence of God 
it makes a difference. And so the angel has a wonderful message to say to these men, fear not. That's what Jesus said to John in the Revelation. He reaches over and says, don't be afraid. Isn't that a wonderful truth that those who know the Lord, those who have a relationship with the Lord, even though uh, when we get into his presence, we're filled with awe and wonder and a reverential fear, there is no reason to fear because of the message that this angel is bringing to them. I have good news. That's the word Galizo, the word from which we get evangel. The gospel comes from this word. It means good news. Gospel literally means good news. And the, and the angel comes and says, we have good news. Great joy. Bring you good news of great joy. That word mega again, mega kara. It's the, it's the, the joy that God gives a complete contentment, a complete satisfaction. It's, it's really the culmination of a lot of different things, but there is a peace and a joy or a, a, a contentment, a satisfaction that comes from knowing the Lord and from the news that he is bringing. Behold, I bring you good news, great joy, be all for all people. Now, as we get to the end of this, we're going to find that this passage of Scripture is probably one of the most misunderstood and misapplied passages in all of the Scripture, particularly when it comes to the secular world. But what we have here, though, is a disposition of God to share the gospel, to give an invitation to all who will hear it. Like John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave, this is, this is the time that John 3.16 speaks of, that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There is a disposition of God that God sends the gospel call to everyone. And in the machinations or, or, or in the workings of, of, of salvation, there is a great mystery that's there, which Deuteronomy 29, 29 speaks of, that the secret things belong to God, but that which he has made known belongs to us. So I don't have to sit and wring my hands about the elect and all of those things. We know that God has issued a call to every person. Everyone underneath the sound of my voice when we preach can hear the gospel. And he says, unto you is born or a great joy for all the people. Now, now, this message is a message directly to the shepherds. But it's also spoken to us. This is a message from heaven, from the throne of God himself, to these men. And as, they're, as they are our representatives there, and through the pages of scripture, it is a message directly to us. Unto you. Them, to you, me, unto you is born this day. Emmanuel. That means God with us. For unto you is born this day. God becomes a man. I remember Brad saying something last week as I was listening. There's, when you speak of, of, of Philippians 2 and the humiliation of Christ and those things, that, and, 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 and all of that, there are times when, when our ability to express, this, this is, I'm paraphrasing his words, but it just becomes almost impossible to express in many ways. The fact that God became man we call that the hypostatic union, where he is fully God, fully man, truly God, truly man, not diminished in any way or capacity, and yet humbling himself and, 
and apparently in, in, in some ways not using some of the attributes of which he could, but God becomes a man. Why did God become a man? To do what God could not do, and that is to die. Die. God becomes a man. We'll swim around in that truth eternity in this morning. In the city of David, Micah 5 2 says, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. Who's coming forth is from of old, from ancient, fulfillment of prophecy. Right here, Luke chapter. Unto you is born this day, verse eleven, in the city of David, Savior, who is Christ. This is a miracle of miracles. A savior. Why did the angel tell Joseph to name his child Jesus? Because he would save them from their sins. Do what? God is my salvation. He came to die. Do you realize that he's the only person in the world who chose to die? Think about that for a minute. He is the only person in the history of mankind. You might could think of Adam and Eve and the decision they made. God told them that they would surely die. That was a consequence of their action. Jesus Christ in all of humanity is the only person in the world who has chosen to die. Now, you may say, well, someone may take their life before the natural time. Someone may commit suicide, this, that, or the other. It's not that they chose to die. They're going to die Anyway, they may have had something to do with the timing, but everyone will. We have no choice in the matter. The young may die, the old will die, but all must die. But the purpose of Jesus Christ being born was so that he would. And that's what this idea of Savior has all wrapped up in it. It is about the purpose and the plan of Christ's life so that he died for our sins according to the scripture. He died to set us free from a law that was strangling the people and from the, those who were uh, in, in responsibility to, to administer the law, putting all of these weights and all of these burdens upon the people. And at this time, a Savior came to free us from the curse of sin, to free us from under the dominion of sin, to free us from the curse of the law, or from the, from the results of the law. He came to be a Savior. He came to die. As Christ, he is the anointed one. He is the one promised to us, the promised Messiah, Christ, Messiah, the same word, Christos. The Hebrew, uh, we would get the word Messiah from that, and he is Lord. He is Lord. A Savior who is Christ, the Lord. And in that one phrase speaks of who Christ is, the one who came to die for our sins, the one who is the, the chosen Messiah, the anointed one, the one who would come and everyone would know based on what was prophesied about him that he is who he said he was and that he is Lord, that he will reign in eternity supreme with everything else underneath his feet. And then he will wrap all of that up and present it to God the Father. Glory. His Savior who is Christ. Then there's the sign. Verse 12, and this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. How many of you know what swaddling clothes are? It took me forever in my life to figure out what swaddling clothes were. I, I remember reading the, uh, in, the, in, the, in church and they were talking about swaddling clothes and the songs and stuff like that. What in the world is swaddling clothes? Well, it's become more common now than it used to be just, I, I'd say, a few decades ago. Have little grandbabies and 
man, they wrap those things so tight, it looks like a burrito with a face sticking out. It's, it's like, man, they're, they're, but it, it kind of comforts a child. It puts, it puts them like in the same kind of confines as in the mother's womb or so, and, and swaddling clothes were used back then, and so the baby would be wrapped tight. Now, there's nothing really significant about swaddling clothes, especially in this time. So there's, there's nothing remarkable about that, but I will tell you it was necessary for the baby that the shepherds found to have swathing clothes. Otherwise, it would not have been the right one. But this idea of being laid in a manger, you don't see much of that going around, do you? Because you're going to find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying, and not born in a manger, lying in a manger. Last week we spoke of the humility of Christ. The king of all eternity. The king of all glory. Now laying in a stable. And laying in a manger. Not the way we would write it, is it? Not the story that we'd put forward for television. None of the pomp and the circumstance. He came for the common man. He came for the common woman. He came for boys and girls. He came for those who know they have nothing to offer, but is willing to give them everything. Everything about Jesus is contrary to probably what we would have conjured up ourselves. He's laying, wrapped in swaddling clothes, Laying in a manger. Finally, we'll look at verses 13 and 14, the praise of the angelic host. And suddenly, verse 13, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Suddenly, without warning, instantaneously, it's like it is there. You blink your eyes and all of a sudden there's this heavenly host, this army of the Lord, this army of angels. And this is where, again, our Christmas Eve Now, our ideas may do us a disservice because this isn't three or four guys, three or four angels that came to accompany the angel that gave the message. This is a vast host of angels. No doubt the countryside was filled with these angelic beings. And if you look in Revelation, you see what we have glimpses of the angels in glory, the cherubim and the seraphim. Of course, angels would appear in the form of men in this time. But it would have covered the hills. It would, Jesus said, I could call 12 legions of angels to come. There's not an indication that this is the entire host of heaven, but a portion of the host of heaven. There are a multitude of, taken out of the entire host And you have the, and and it's interesting, the Bible tells us that the angels are curious to look into the things about salvation. They don't understand the love of God like we do. We understand the love of God from the perspective of one who was condemned, who was guilty, who is destined for death, destined for eternity without God, destined for an eternity of judgment, and one who came and purchased and bought us back giving of himself, taking the wrath of God on himself from my place and your place so that we could have an eternity with him. The angels know nothing about that. What kind of love? What must have been going through their mind at the, at the, the, the proclamation of this announcement? But they're praising God and They probably did not sing this. In fact, you don't really see a lot about angels singing in Scripture. It doesn't necessarily mean they don't. Job speaks of the morning stars singing together, which could be a reference to that. But but even in in Revelation, you see they're saying. But whatever, they are expressing this great truth, and they're giving praise to where it belongs, giving praise to the God of heaven, glory to God in the highest which is a doxology itself, doxa, praise, that they are singing this doxology or saying this doxology to God, and on earth, peace among those whom he is well pleased, with whom he is well pleased. And this is 
This is where perhaps maybe because of the King James interpretation, it's not, a, it's, a, it's not a necessarily an easy passage to interpret necessarily. But what does the King James says say? Goodwill toward men. Well, yes and no. It is God's good will in the proclamation of the gospel to all who will hear. But on earth, peace, good will toward men. Maybe this is where we get the real meaning of Christmas. How many times do you see it in the secular world? That somehow the true meaning of Christmas is just being nice to someone. The true meaning of Christmas is, is everybody getting along. And you know, there is a truth about that to a certain extent. 1914, World War I on the Western Front, on Christmas Eve, a, 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 a sort of a impromptu truce broke out along the Western Front. British and German soldiers conversing and eating and sharing refreshment together over Christmas. Even now, we do see there is this idea that folks tend to try to be better. They don't, they're not necessarily better in the children's department at Sears. I worked over that one Christmas. I'm going to tell you what, there's some mean mamas that will break your neck if you try to get something they got their hands on. But there is this idea that does. But Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. Matthew 10, 34 through 39, says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The bonds that bond us to one another in Christ is stronger than any other bond. Christianity has been a lightning rod. It's separate. It divides. The world hates Christ and what he represents because the gospel means that there's something wrong. The gospel means that we are sinners. The gospel means that we need a Savior. And the good news is that we have a Savior who is Christ. What peace do we have? Truly at the core it is the peace of of God, peace with God, peace of God. We've been reconciled to God, so we have peace with God, and we have the presence of God in us through the Holy Spirit, and we have the peace of God. Where's the strife? Where's the doubt? Jesus Christ came to bring peace among us, with whom he is well. Those who belong to him. That peace, that true peace can only be realized. Believers, we get past Christmas. We get past the manger. We go on to the cross. This is what What about you? Who presents the gospel? Who presents Christ to us today? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. We we proclaim the gospel, we tell the gospel, but it is the Holy Spirit himself who brings the announcement of the gospel. You heard his call today. Would you receive the good news of the gospel this day have you heeded the call will you serve him not as a baby in a manger but as king of kings and lord of lords the sovereign of the universe the sovereign of time the sovereign of history will you get past the manger and get to the one who is our savior who is Christ Spend a moment in prayer. You may want to come pray at this altar if you would like to speak with me or Brother Brad or someone after the service about the things we've talked about.
love to sit with you and share more about Jesus. Whatever on your heart, whatever's on your mind, deal with that with the Lord. Father, so thankful for the gift that you've given. Proclamation of the angel. We have a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Father, help us to walk in that truth, to embrace that truth. Lord, to call upon him who can save to the uttermost. Able to save. Thank you, Lord. Pray these things in Jesus. Thank you.